This video is brought to you by Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. This video was supposed to come out in June, like it was supposed to be a Pride Month special, and then bad Cinderella started haunting my every waking thought. So this one's gonna be less of a Pride Month event, I think, and more like me telling my mom I was bi. Delayed, met with mild confusion, but hopefully ultimately embraced. So I've actually already done a video about queer baiting, like the half a decade ago. It was actually one of my first videos, like number 10 or something. And that one was just about fiction because that's how the term was exclusively being used back then. I was like, hey, the term queer baiting has been used to mean like 10 different things. And I don't think we should actually call a pairing we like not being canon or a creator doing everything they can to depict a gay relationship within the parameters of censorship queerbaiting. Basically, uh, queerbaiting is a very specific marketing tactic where creators will intentionally include hints that a character might not be straight in order to draw in a queer audience, despite the fact that they have no intention of actually following up on those hints so as not to alienate straight viewers. Um, I've talked about the term a couple other times since then, especially in relation to the show Supernatural and bank robber Cantaloupe's Sherlock. You know... I know the Benedict Cumberbatch name jokes are old enough that H Bomber guy made fun of them being unfunny six years ago, but at this point I'm sort of just hoping that if I stick with it, it'll loop back around to being funny again. And for what it's worth, I still believe both shows did include those hints and nudges very intentionally. The term has always been kind of muddied though. I mean, even now you have people fighting each other online about whether Good Omens season one was queerbaiting now that they've kissed for real, and has become even more so in recent years. Queerbaiting has been used to refer to, say, a TV show where both characters are canonically stated to be not straight, but there's ambiguity on whether or not they'll specifically get together, or stories created by queer people, or Marvel movies? It's the queer baiting for me. The, the, the event- none of them even like each other! <laughs> Point being, it's always been kind of a messy term. It's a term I used to use a lot, and one I've become kind of disillusioned with in general. But in recent years, the term queerbaiting has kind of taken on a secondary meaning. Where it was once used exclusively in relation to fiction, we've seen a massive rise over the past few years of the term being used to refer to real people. Celebrities who seem to cultivate an aesthetic of queerness but may not actually be gay, straight actors who play gay characters, even authors in some cases. We've increasingly seen the sexualities of public figures called into question specifically under the assumption that they are somehow appropriating signs of queerness to cultivate a specific fan base and make money. I want to talk about that, the shift in what this term means, and the resulting rise in these accusations as they pertain to real people. I want to look into why this has started to happen, how this might affect people in general, and more importantly, where we ought to go from here. So, what's going on? The shift in what this term means has been going on for a while and has been used to refer to a number of different celebrities, but if I had to name one of the earliest and most prominent examples of this, I'd probably point to former One Direction member Harry Styles. So speculation around Styles' sexuality is certainly nothing new. I grew up on Tumblr, so although I was never intensely entrenched in it, it was virtually impossible to escape Larry Stylinson. The pairing between Harry and uh, one of the One Direction boys with an L name, I always go to look up which one, and within seconds I always forget. But Larry was huge. I mean, there was a massive swath of fanfiction about those two getting together, fans were convinced they were dating, but that their management was forcing them to stay closeted for marketability. At one point I think there was even talk of crowdfunding money to buy One Direction from its management so that they could be together. Which I really appreciate in terms of turning the tables, now One Direction is sold to you. But people have believed Styles to be potentially gay or bisexual for years. He's had public relationships with women, which again have been subject to intense scrutiny from fans. In recent years, Styles has taken on much less mainstream forms of gender presentation. He'll often perform or be photographed in skirts, dresses, pink feather boas, and uh, whatever this thing is. Some people love it, and a lot of people hate it. Like really hate it. In all fairness, I don't think these fits are all that great either. I find him a bit grating, to, to be honest, but like, holy shit, people just eat him alive for it. He's also refused to publicly label his sexuality, stating that he feels like because he's such a public person, his sexuality is one of the few things that's his. 
As a result, there's been a huge uptick of accusations that Styles is queerbaiting, that he is specifically a straight man using the aesthetics of queerness and refusing to label his sexuality to profit off of the ambiguity, get popular, and make money. That man is a poser, he's obviously queerbaiting and not actually marginalized, king of queerbaiting, it's just marketing to attract an LGBT audience, he's pretending, the list goes on. To be clear, this isn't just a few annoying people online, it's a lot of annoying people online. It got to the point where he had to actually address it in an interview, basically just saying, no I'm not, I'm just wearing a skirt. As he says, I'm off sprinkling in nuggets of sexual ambiguity to try to be more interesting. No, I want things to look a certain way, not because it makes me look gay, or it makes me look straight, or it makes me look bisexual, but because I think it looks cool. And more than that, I don't know, I just think sexuality is something that's fun. Honestly, I can't say I've given it any more thought than that. Well, fuck him, right? What people saw as talking around the question seems to have only intensified the backlash, and the popular perception among a lot of people is specifically that this guy is a straight culture vulture who is more than happy to make bank off of the ambiguity that skirts offer him but would never, say, kiss another man. Why else would he give such vague and non-committal answers? The conversation, of course, has extended beyond just styles and to a wide variety of celebrities for a wide variety of reasons. Singer Billie Eilish is queerbaiting because she posted some pictures in a music video of a sleepover with the caption, I love girls. Actor Kit Connor is queerbaiting because he played a bi character on TV and then was spotted holding hands with a woman. Gay YA book Love Simon is queerbaiting because Simon is a normie and the book was written by a straight woman. More on that later. Demi Lovato is queerbaiting because she used they them pronouns for a while and then decided those pronouns weren't for her. Taylor Swift is queerbaiting because, you know, I feel like I need a corkboard and some red string to dig into that one, so let's just leave it at that. Point being, these critiques have become near ubiquitous in our pop culture lexicon. You'll even see, like, viral tweets with full on lists of which celebrities we're not supposed to trust because they're queerbaiters who have never dated someone of the same gender. Fuck you, 19 year old, tell me your dating history, or else. Essentially, according to these critiques, these people are being deceptive to make money and gain acclaim. Like, oh shit, is Billie Eilish into women? Is Lady Gaga one of us? I guess I have no choice but to buy their albums. So there's some issues here with this framework, and we're most certainly going to dive into that. But I also want to note that the term queerbaiting, as it's taken on this new meaning, or at least the concept behind deceptive people using the trappings of queerness for clout, isn't just used to refer to famous people. Rather, there's this prevalent notion as well that people who are breaking gender roles in general should be scrutinized for signs of deceptiveness, and indeed, that there are a wide variety of reasons a person might have to lie about this. And oftentimes those conversations can take on kind of a darker tone, because in these cases people are often not just being accused of being deceptive because they want clout, but because they are predators. I want to talk about that first, because I think the tone this has taken on is far more serious and impactful than people making fun of Harry Styles' feather boas. As a specific example of this, there's this kind of cottage industry of hot takes around men who are perceived as straight and cis, wearing skirts and dressing in a feminine way. It's gotten better over recent years, but for a while you couldn't throw a stone without hitting a claim that these men are deceptive and dangerous. This one claims there are hundreds of cis white boys using skirts to manipulate and prey on girls. This one says men at large are picking up on wearing skirts in order to attract girls, which of course is manipulative. This one says every skirt wearing guy they've ever met was doing it to manipulate women. This one discusses feminine men weaponizing femininity via skirts and uh, curly hair in order to make women trust them and then abuse them. These are the most harsh kinds of condemnation, but even outside the explicit most of these people are abusers stuff, you'll also find a wide array of critiques that essentially say that a lot of men who dress in a feminine manner are essentially insincere, that they are primarily doing it for clout or to make women like them, or that they are likely to still be bigots who are dressing femininely to deceive people about this. Basically, it has been a popular sentiment to say that a masculine looking person doing feminine looking things is likely to be particularly untrustworthy. And is that a real thing that can happen? Maybe, but the way this gets weaponized in discussions is often less so a response to any actual harm that has occurred and more what feels to me like a post hoc justification for a pre-existing harmful viewpoint. 
I'll state the obvious right off the bat. A lot of these guys might not be straight, or even cis for that matter. Lots of closeted people engage in non-straight expression, even forms of non-straight expression that are kind of demonized, whether it's kissing other girls when drunk at parties, or trying out gender non-conforming presentation, and you cannot actually meaningfully and reliably tell the difference between a straight person and a closeted queer person at first glance. If the idea is that only people who are queer can dress like a queer person, whatever that means, then functionally we have cut off an avenue for closeted or questioning people to experiment and start to realize who they are. See also people being upset when someone tries out a new set of pronouns but decides those pronouns aren't right for them. If we condemn this as queer baiting, we essentially put pressure on people to get it right the first time. You can experiment, but only if your experimentation leads to one specific foregone conclusion. With that kind of massive pressure, a lot of people are just not going to experiment at all, and might then actually be less likely to discover important things about who they are. And it's difficult to see anything about men being feminine to gain women's trust and then harm them, and for my mind not to immediately go to the host of similar accusations thrown at trans women. A lot of times people will say they want to protect women from manipulative men weaponizing femininity, and they won't actually mean men. But even when we are genuinely talking about straight dudes wearing skirts for clout, I think this condemnation is fundamentally conservative. In a lot of ways, conservatism is an ideology of disgust, right? People feel an instinctive sense of disgust at things that are unfamiliar, or demonized, or sit outside of the status quo, and so will make up a justification for that disgust after the fact. They see a drag queen with a flamboyant wig and instinctively feel confused and grossed out, and construct an elaborate reason as to why she must be dangerous. They feel a deep fear of someone who doesn't have housing first, and then all of their long screeds about how that person deserves it and is a blight on society come second. And indeed, the same principle applies Applies here. I think many people will instinctively feel uncomfortable with a man in a skirt and then decide to follow up with the narrative that he must be trying to manipulate women or something. For a man to look feminine is in and of itself a cause to be suspicious of him. As the claim goes, he needs some justification for that behavior. For instance, is he gay in order to make the deviant behavior explainable and therefore more okay? Dressing to attract women, looking attractive for clout, both very normal things that the vast majority of people do anyway, now suddenly become framed as duplicitous and deviant only in the context of gender nonconformity. While this is obviously not to say that there could never exist a scenario where someone attempts to weaponize their perceived softness as a manipulation tool, it's a lot more fucking common for manipulative men trying to deceive women to do so within the parameters of traditional male presentation. That is actually the norm. I mean, we don't see takes like, you should be inherently suspicious of straight men who grow out their beards because they're probably just doing it to make women like them, or men who wear ties are trying to look authoritative so that they can manipulate people more easily. Acting outside of your prescribed gender role is then seen as deceitful and dangerous. Acting within it is normal. This sucks. This keeps people locked into a very specific performance of gender. It's a policy of containment and control wrapped in the language of progressivism. We're very focused on language right now in general in progressive online spheres. We have these long lists of exactly what terminology to use in certain settings, what not to say, we have a pretty big collective vocabulary that's traditionally associated with progressive spaces, and this is not a bad thing by any means, not at all. In many ways, it's even inevitable. Social media platforms primarily serve as conduits for communication. Since actions aren't as visible in this digital realm, words are most of what we have to go on with each other. But what the intense focus on language above all else can cause is that if you want to fit in and progressive spaces, that's usually the first thing you learn. You learn not to say spirit animal in casual conversation before you learn about the principles of decolonization. You learn terms like gaslighting and appropriation before you really dig that deeply into what they mean. You learn not to say bigoted things before you learn not to do or believe bigoted things. And indeed, what I think is happening here is that we're dressing up a distrust of people who break gender roles as a critique of abusive behavior because the people 
doing that distrusting have learned the right words to say. That isn't to say that I think the majority of these people are full-on conservatives. Most would never consciously state that being gender non-conforming without an obvious reason is a sign of untrustworthiness. But it's more so that everyone is going to have blind spots or have an instinctive disgust or confusion reaction to something they shouldn't because we live in a society. We've been bombarded with decades of media, for instance, that acts in line with these same ideas that gender nonconformity is unnatural or insidious. I'm not immune to this either. No one is. It's very normal. But when we do feel ourselves having a disgust reaction or feeling uncomfortable with something, that doesn't mean immediately jumping to whatever language is most accessible to us to justify that reaction post hoc. I feel as though the same applies to this conversation about celebrities, to be completely honest. Of course, rich celebrities have shields that your average person doesn't have, and I think the men in skirts are deceptive abusers so watch out conversation is more tangibly harmful. But I think the underlying mentality, gender nonconformity is suspicious, so if there isn't a good reason for it, explain yourself or else, exists in both cases, and it kind of concerns me to see on such a wide scale. I don't want to spend too much time on this next point. Because when we talk about real people and queer baiting, this is the obvious point everyone makes, and I'm not saying anything groundbreaking here. But I do still think this needs to be said, because you know those examples I used earlier? This straight author is queer baiting for writing a gay book, this straight actor is queer baiting for playing a bisexual character, all of that. Those people aren't straight. Becky Albertalli, who wrote Love, Simon, is bisexual, and when she came out, she referenced the fact that people putting public scrutiny on her identity when she wrote her book made it harder for her to grapple with her own sexuality. In her words, she was held up again and again as the quintessential example of a straight woman writing shitty queer books for the straights, profiting off of communities I had no connection to. I'm doing this because I've been scrutinized, subtweeted, mocked, lectured, and invalidated just about every single day for years, and I'm exhausted. Kit Connor did not want to come out as bisexual. When he came out, it was because he felt pressured to do so because of the queerbaiting accusations. He may be a wealthy celebrity, I have no idea how much money he has to be honest, but he was also a closeted teenager who was very new to the public eye. Actor and terminally online Instagram poster Jamila Jamil received criticism for judging a show on ballroom culture because she was a straight woman and later came out as bisexual, expressing that she felt pressured to do so. I will say that there were other reasons to critique her participation, it is a largely black art form, but in terms of the specific critique that she was straight, she was pressured to come out before she was ready. The singer Ashniko expressed that they felt pressured to come out as queer and gender fluid before they were ready after being criticized for being a cis person, fetishizing queer people, and criticizing cisgender men in their music. It feels as though there's a story like this every five minutes, where we get angry at a celebrity en masse for being a straight person who seems too gay, and then, oops, they're not straight and felt harassed into coming out of the closet. And while you might just say, well, maybe they shouldn't try to make queer art if they're not ready to come out then, of course people will assume they're a straight person trying to profit off of queerness. I don't think that's fair at all. As I already said, many people will use queer expression as a form of experimentation, and if you have to already know who you are to try these things out at all, a lot of people will simply have no avenue to explore their identity. I also just think closeted people have stories worth telling. One of the things Jamila Jamil mentioned when she came out was that in her experience, it's not always easy to come out as a member of the South Asian community. When we deem closeted stories unworthy of being told, we're also prioritizing the queer experiences of people for whom it is safe to come out, people who are more likely to have the privilege and safety net to do so. That being said, when we do focus this conversation exclusively on famous people, I think it is worth asking ourselves one thing. Are celebrities actually real people? I mean, yes, obviously they are real breathing human beings with internality and emotions. But to some extent, I also think there is some meaningful difference between, say, Harry Styles the person and Harry Styles the celebrity, right? What we are being sold nowadays, who appears in interviews, who we follow on social media, is not necessarily a single person, but a fictional persona carefully constructed out of a celebrity's most marketable traits. PR teams work to shape that fiction, spend hours designing a signature look that is immediately recognizably Ariana Grande or Adam Lambert or Olivia Rodrigo, set up public appearances designed to impart a certain image to the world, turn their social media presence into a carefully curated market-tested version 
expression of a singular personality. The most obvious and egregious example of this is, of course, the construction of boy bands. Members are carefully scouted according to existing archetypes, their images styled and personalities molded to fit group dynamics akin to a superhero team from a cartoon. Whole people are very purposefully flattened into the funny one, or the bad boy, or the sensitive one. Of course, that's just where the trend is the most visible. Across the spectrum of singers and actors and social media influencers, people are simplified into products, simulacra pushed into pre-existing narratives only loosely based on their own internalities as real people. To that extent, celebrities almost kind of are fictional characters, right? These personas are indeed based on the real human being inhabiting them, but they're often exaggerated and archetypical. Take Chris Pratt's friendly goofball persona. That is a cartoon caricature. That is a guy being reduced to a few recognizably marketable attributes. Like, no wonder the entire Disney lineup did an Avengers Assemble thing to defend him when some Twitter teens found out he goes to a homophobic megachurch. Worse than just finding him annoying or oversaturated, it threatened the brand. Lots has been said of course, about how social media does kind of do this to everyone. If you haven't yet read the Substack piece Standing on the Shoulders of Complex Female Characters by Rain Fisher Kwan, I highly recommend checking it out. You know, nowadays we are all kind of filtering ourselves into what can be brandified, but this is especially distinct with celebrity, where instead of simply trying to package ourselves into our most cartoonifiable characteristics, we are being sold, in effect, a person created by a company to be sold. People make a whole fuss about virtual influencers and fake AI people, but celebrities are already virtual influencers, they're just not animated. Which kind of forces us to question, in effect, is it not possible that celebrity queerbaiting might still be the case? I guess for the most accessible version of this, I would point to Tattoo, the Russian music duo who gave us everyone's favorite LimeWire bop, All the Things She Said. They were pretty big in the 2000s, and a large amount of their public image revolved around presenting themselves as lesbians. Their styling was based on the film Show Me Love about two teenage girls who enter a relationship. The band name can apparently read as a shortened version of This Girl Loves That Girl in Russian, and indeed, their very first single was all about being in love with another girl and the anxieties surrounding it. It whips ass. I love it. The controversy surrounding their public image provoked outrage, and therefore, as provoking outrage tends to do, boosted their fame significantly. The music video for All the Things She Said, featuring two girls in school uniforms kissing, was banned in a number of places, faced censorship campaigns, and also topped the charts in at least 10 countries. The group continued to play on their image of controversy and really leaned into the gay schoolgirl aesthetic, regularly kissing on stage and in interviews holding hands, and overall just making it very clear that at least the characters of Tattoo were gay. Until they confirmed in an interview substantially later that no, they weren't actually lesbians and they weren't a couple. Their public image was quite literally a marketing ploy. Much like how the central fictional conceit of Ailstorm is that they're pirates, the central fictional conceit of Tattoo is that they're lesbians. It was never real. There's been a sort of cultural reappraisal of all the things she said in recent years, and the notion that what happened with Tattoo was deeply homophobic and overall exploitative. It's become kind of controversial, like, on one hand, when researching this video, I found a lot of accounts of lesbians and bi women who felt seen for the very first time because of this band, or who felt like it was helping increase visibility in general. On the other, I found people who were offended by the notion that this public image was specifically created to court controversy, and at the idea of being lied to so that the band can get their money. I do think there's some complexity here, like these were a couple of minors who were being pushed into this public image by a record company that wanted to make money. I think flattening down the issue of how these young teenagers were pushed into a very fetishized performance of sexuality to make money for a large record company exclusively down to queerbaiting does miss out on some of the bigger picture here. If this is something worthy of condemnation, I don't think their teenage selves are the ones to condemn. One of the members now identifies as a straight ally who supports the community, and one of them came out as a bisexual woman, but a homophobic bisexual woman. And I mean very homophobic, not just a they live in Russia and can't be as vocally supportive as they might want kind of thing. She said all this stuff about how she doesn't care if a woman wants to love another woman, but that it's not okay to be a gay man in a really awful way, and then kind of just vanished from the public eye. Regardless, though, the case story of Tattoo does highlight the way things like this can happen. It is notable, of course, that Tattoo wasn't primarily trying to attract a queer audience, 
audience, but rather trying to use their identity as a marketing tactic for a majority straight one. But the distinction between performers as characters and performers as people still holds. You know, when people talk about queerbaiting, this example is usually held up as the very clear-cut, very outrageous kind. But it's important to note that the same kind of mechanisms used to create tattoo, reducing people to caricatures, shortening complex stories into easily packageable ideas, are routinely used today, just typically to people with more agency over the story they're telling and with more subtlety. And so, you know, maybe it is the case that when styling XYZ celebrity's public image, visual nods to queerness are intentionally and cynically added for the sole purpose of marketing. So. Perhaps the same cues we use to evaluate how characters are treated in fiction are not entirely invalid metrics by which to judge celebrities either. As much as I've spent the last five minutes entertaining this idea, I have to say that at the end of the day, I don't agree with it. And I don't agree with it for two reasons. So I see this line of reasoning all the time when it comes to like, are boys who wear skirts just doing it for clout or something, with the notion being that it is specifically bad because those boys are probably secretly homophobic and are going to start saying slurs. And I kind of feel the same way about the tattoo situation as I do with that. If that is indeed the case, that people are courting the image of being queer but actually have bigoted beliefs, then the problem with that isn't really the pretending, it's the bigotry. At the end of the day, if someone is homophobic, I actually don't think it's very relevant whether or not they're somehow pretending to be queer. That's not what I care about. Secondly though, even if we accept that straight celebrities using queerness as a marketing strategy is a real thing that people do and is always straightforwardly bad, even then, I think this is a harm that culturally we just have to eat, you know? I would rather a thousand fake queer people get away with profiting off of queerness than one person be forced out of the closet before they are ready. Again, if you don't know someone's out, there's no way to perfectly tell if something is a story by a straight person or a story by a closeted person. When Helicopter Story came out, some people were analyzing the content of Isabel Fall's writing and were positive it was by a straight cis man. It wasn't. The notion that you can always just know if someone is closeted is very harmful. Though we may be worried about letting in people who simply want to profit off of us, the alternative relegates often the most vulnerable people in the closet to the sidelines and subjects them to scorn and scrutiny if they express themselves at all. Even if we do accept that celebrity queerbaiting is real and is bad, that's worse. That's so much worse. And celebrities will be fine. I think this excessive focus on celebrities in this conversation is misguided for that reason. I still think it is bad if someone like Harry Styles was a closeted bisexual man and we criticized him for looking too gay without coming out, but he is also very unlikely to be subject to the worst material consequences of coming out. But attitudes like this trickle down and influence what's socially acceptable everywhere. I mean, some of the people who get harassed for queerbaiting aren't even closeted, they're literally openly queer. Like that popular tweet getting upset at various celebrities like Lady Gaga and Bella Ramsey. Bella Ramsey is a non-binary teenager. Lady Gaga is openly bisexual. These claims often just become a transparent excuse to harass bisexual and non-binary people. And while Lady Gaga will be fine, what does it do to people who are far less safe to come out, who may feel as though their only options are stay closeted and be harassed for it, or come out and be potentially put in danger? The beliefs underlying all of this hurt everyone. The idea that everyone is straight and cis until proven otherwise. The idea that we have a moral imperative to find and weed out fakers in the community. The idea that gender non-conforming expression requires a reason or else you are a liar and a predator. The idea that it is ever okay to deeply scrutinize a person's gender expression or dating history to see if they're lying about who they are. The idea that if you do publicly experiment with your presentation, you have to get it right the first time or you are deceptive and malicious. I would let every straight celebrity who wants to queerbait do that if it meant getting rid of those attitudes. That being said, everything about forcing people to out themselves and the dangers of those things has been talked about in the past. And while I still think it's true, I also think there are other factors that motivate this intense focus on determining whether or not someone is really a queer person. 
which is that, especially among younger people, there seems to be a very limited and prescriptive framework used to discuss queerness that I'm not personally the most comfortable with. And I think that framework is what motivates these discussions. There's been this push to narrow down what it means to be queer to a very limited checklist of identities. You have to exclusively choose one of L, G, B, or T, and doing so almost becomes like choosing a divergent faction. Here is an exact set of terms you can use to describe your experience. Here is the exact pride flag you are supposed to wear. Here is what gives you legitimacy. Anyone who deviates from this must therefore not really be queer or must be intending to deceive or appropriate. And I think this increasingly popular perception is at odds with what queerness actually means in the material world. Like, if a streamer identifies as a straight cis man but lives his life pretty much exclusively within a traditional female gender presentation, is he doing something queer? In my opinion, yeah. If we're not just talking about a prescriptive set of checklists, but a lack of conformity to the hegemonic and gendered model of families, relationships, sex, then yeah. There are ways of engaging with the world which are materially rewarded and which are materially punished. People do and have, say, lost their jobs and been materially marginalized for the exact same forms of presentation that could be decried here as queerbaiting. I don't think identity labels are worthless, but I do think focusing on them to the exclusion of all other experiences misses out on a lot of depth and nuance and also discounts people who are living and engaging with queerness in ways that may not fit neatly into a small set of relatively new labels. From the narrow constraints we place on how we discuss queerness to our obsession with clear-cut identities, we've cultivated a culture that's ripe for the emergence of concepts like accusing real people of queerbaiting. Just as the insistent focus on hyper-specific identity labels can lead to misconceptions and exclusion within our community, so too can our understanding and usage of terms like queerbaiting evolve and sometimes mislead. And honestly, I kind of think this concept has outstayed its usefulness. The more I think about the concept of queerbaiting, the more I genuinely think we should just retire it. Beliefs change. Uh, I was like 19 when I made that queerbaiting video, and the media landscape has changed too. When we've reached the point that the term has come to encapsulate like 500 things, real people being closeted, real people being bisexual, censored gay relationships and TV, ships people like that aren't canon, the actual use of queerness as a marketing tactic with the intent to deceive a queer audience, etc., I think the term has ceased to be useful. Yeah, there are a few pieces of media out there that genuinely do fit that original description. The marketing around tattoo, that's queerbaiting. BBC Sherlock, that's queerbaiting. But to be honest, I think the term does more harm than good at this point, and I'm more than willing to sacrifice the very, very few use cases where it does actually help us vocalize a real problem to get rid of the way this term has become a cudgel against so many members of the community. I think the deeper root of this issue, to be honest, Honest, is this concept of representation. A lot of young queer people my age and even younger teenagers and whatnot have really grown attached to this phrase, uh, queer rep. Is this Marvel character good gay rep? I want to support this lesbian singer because I want more lesbian rep in media. I don't like this fictional character because they're bad bisexual rep. I've talked about representation at length in All or Nothing, and I do think it is very natural and even good to want to see people who are like us. I don't think I need to make a case here for the myriad reasons that's good to see prominent gay people in real life and in fiction. But I do think we've lost the plot a little bit when we talk about these things only in terms of how well they represent us. What we're looking to, in the vast majority of cases, are for our own lives to be reflected back to us by large corporations and the art they produce, or by celebrities. And I think that's never going to happen because we're looking in the wrong places. When we assume that for a story to be given value, it needs wide-scale legitimacy, we're assigning too much importance to corporate entities to determine what is meaningful. So, for instance, we've come to believe that a fictional relationship being recognized as canon somehow elevates it above all the rich interpretations and personal resonances readers can draw from it. Like, think about people hassling Neil Gaiman for decades about whether or not the guys in Good Omens are gay or not. 
Why do we need this answer to make the readings we do legitimate? Why would some official stamp of canonization from an author hold more weight than the myriad connections audiences have made with the work? Is the upper middle class gay couple in, say, Modern Family a more meaningfully queer story than queer readings derived from other stories by fans simply because it's canon? Why do we let corporate or authorial validations dictate the value of our personal connections to art? That brings me to what we're saying about celebrities. If we do indeed perceive of celebrities as essentially media to the extent that we believe they can queerbait because they are also brands, then they're basically akin to being a Disney product. That is Disney's Frozen. I'm not saying these stories aren't valuable or that they don't reflect queer life to some extent, but in the end, we're going to be disappointed if we keep looking to massive media outlets and rich celebrities for meaningful reflections of our lived experience. There is such a massive wealth of queer art out there that I think does something more meaningful than be queer representation. Instead, they are queer stories. Indie webcomics, smaller scale novels, games, things made by individuals that reflect their own lived experience without corporate oversight or with any particular need to be palatable to a whole audience so that it can be used as marketing material. In my opinion, there does not exist any hypothetical like Marvel movie with a bisexual woman character that could meaningfully represent me in the same way independent art not made to be distributed by like Amazon would. That's not to say the latter shouldn't exist or has no value whatsoever, but should celebrities Celebrities and large-scale corporate art be the sole yardstick we look to in order to tell our stories? I don't think so, and I think this whole notion of desperately looking for validity through celebrities confirming their sexualities in TV networks deeming gay couples canon is somewhat misguided. Beyond the harm that the queerbaiting narrative can do to closeted people, I also think it just reflects that we are looking to the wrong people to give our experiences value. I'm gonna link to some independent queer media that I personally like in the description of this video, but I also encourage everyone in the comments to link stuff that they like too. Let's give value to stories not given to us from on high. Who cares if Harry Styles is bi or not? In truth, as we look for validation in these mammoth franchises and A-list celebrities, we can also sometimes forget that creation and storytelling exist within all of us. I think there's a lot of value in what we can craft ourselves. Just as I've been championing things like indie webcomics and novels and oh my god, indie TTRPGs, I could talk about those forever, I also believe in equipping ourselves with tools and skills to tell our own tales. Recently, I've been getting back into writing, albeit fanfiction, I have this long bisexual cyberpunk technomancy battle of the bands project going on right now, and it's helped me a lot to have a place to practice those skills. But as with anything, there's always room for growth, which is actually why why I've been taking a storytelling course on Skillshare, my sponsor for this video. I love writing, uh, but I've never really had formal training in it, um, but I've been taking this um, storytelling 101 character conflict context and craft class that really dives into the DNA of what makes stories work, and that's been incredibly helpful for me. Basically, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes where you can really dive into anything and everything. It offers classes in everything from illustration and photography to web development and music production. You'll find courses on creative writing, marketing, animation, and even freelance entrepreneurship, among others. It's also ad-free, so you can develop your skills without ads, and there are new premium classes constantly being launched. If you're interested in joining Skillshare, just click the link in my description. The first 1,000 people who click that link will get a one Month free trial of Skillshare. On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I'd like to give a special thank you to my $20 plus patrons. 124MM10, Clayton and Claire Page, Henry Price, Jack Heydrich, Kelly Green, Lachlan Newport, Matthew Sample, Queen Autumn Ween, Robert Valentine Allen, Roman Antonacci, Sophie McLaughlin, Yehuda Katz, and Zeke Della Meme. I also have a patron who'd like me to shout out a charity, so today I'm shouting out the Foundation of Hope. It's a small charity in Vancouver that helps resettle LGBTQ refugees who face persecution for their identity. I will link their information in the description.